Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first announcement. Uh, this talk is about causality, not about optimization. The persons for optimization at this spot move, are moved to uh, Thursday in the latent variable model. So if you want to listen to this talk, please come on Thursday. Um, this work is about causality, a uh, joint work with Joris Moe. And um, one thing you all, all learned about causality is that correlation does not imply causation. As an example, this is a very famous example. On the x-axis, you see um, the number of, uh, like the number of kilograms um, of chocolate consumption in a country. And on the y-axis, you need the number of Nobel Prize winners. And you see like a very strong linear correlation. It's about 80% and there's a very, very low uh, p-value. So the question is, if I make a country eat more chocolate, does they produce more Nobel Prizes or the other way around? And you have the strong, strong intuition that this is not the case. So the question is now, why not? Why does um, correlation not imply causation? And the answer is um, quite simple. If you, have, um, if you have random variables which are correlated, then besides x causes y or y causes x, the dependence could also be explained just by latent confounders, feedback loops, cycles, selection bias, other forms of interaction like deterministic or geometric constraints, or all combinations of these. So this is a problem. So to infer causality, we need causal models, that's like the conclusion here, uh, that can address and adjust for all these kind of dependencies. And uh, we, we can just look at the literature, what kind of models are already there. We have models with the assumption that there are no confounders, no cycles, that are usually the DAG-based uh, models, like Bayesian networks, Markovian mo models, which were is, like, very famous and are taught in all machine learning courses. Then we have the ones which allow for uh, confounders, but they're still a cyclic, ADMGs, semi Markovi model, MDEX. Um, and then on the other hand, we have models which allow for cycles, like cyclic interaction, feedback loops, and so on, but they don't allow for uh, confounders, and they're usually very restricted in their assumptions, like they're like linear models or discrete variables, and so on. And what we want to do is we want to extend this and do both at once, and we also want to allow for all kind of um, functions, nonlinear functions. So we want to allow for confounders, for cycles, and nonlinear functions. So, and uh, what we developed is what we called uh, modular structural causal models. And uh, I will like show you the definition, how we defined it. So uh, modular structural causal model, what is it? It depends of nodes, observed nodes, so corresponding to observed variables mainly. Then latent nodes, which we cannot observe, but we need to assume that the model kind of has them in there. Then the directed graph structure between them. So, and uh, the main point is we don't say a cyclic directed graph structure, it's a directed structure, because we allow for cycles. Then we need a latent probability distribution, um, which is, uh, which kind of infers, uh, induces a distribution on observed variables. And we need uh, a mechanism which tells us how this is done. We need for every node, we need um, a structural equation. Um, dependent node given its parents. That's a usual assumption. That uh, the parents are like the direct causes and uh, we need to model this. But uh, now like the new thing is that we also um, need to model functions for every cycle because we need to say um, um, what like the global, the, the global um, function relations are and we need to do this in a way um, such as the whole system is globally compatible. So in the example, you see, um, you see like um, node six and seven in the right corner, um, and we need to model um, the dependence of this cycle, like in, in itself, dependent on its joint parent, let's say like uh, the variable four, the latent variable four, and then we need to, to have um, a function for uh, six and seven itself, depending on the latent variable and seven and six. So this is like what we need to do, and the question is, what does globally compatible mean? Instead of like writing you down what it means definitionally, um, definitorily, I will give you just a hint. So look at this um, gear analogy. You have three gear, which are like locally compatible. You see they're like all fit perfectly into each other. But as you see, uh, globally it makes no sense if you're trying to, uh, trying to like, uh, um, uh, make one of them move, the others won't move. So it's not possible uh, to make this work. Um, but if you have like in a cycling model, that's usually like the DAG version here, then the local compatibility kind of is enough to ensure that globally things work out. And that's the reason why people didn't 
need to think about these kind of compatibility assumptions before, because they, if they're no cycles, they don't need to have this assumption. And here's like a cycling model which has this global compatibility. So if you're trying to, to move one of these gears, the others will follow. And uh, we are, like the main point is here, we, like our modular structural causal model, we'll just say we just focus on the right hand side. So on the two on the right, and we'll discard the left hand side. And if you make this assumption, then everything will fall in place. Um, we have a theorem which says like, what if I have only local um, mechanisms? Um, and I still uh, don't know about these global stuff for every cycle and so on. And we have a um, theorem which says like, if every cyclic component is contractive, then you don't need basically to model the other one because they will be implicitly assigned by like an update rule, by cyclic running around the cycle conditionally on the input. Um, so um, we have a few um, good properties with these models, which are very desirable. Um, think about this model we had before, and we, wanna, we don't know um, the data of um, the node three here in yellow. Um, that means like, instead of being an observed variable, it now becomes a latent variable, and we still wanna be in the model class. So uh, we need to define what it means to um, marginalize it out. Graphically, it's very easy. You just uh, take it away and you run around the cycles uh, just further, so if you're a direct edge, you go the other direct edge. And then for the functions, um, it's very easy, just plug it in. And uh, this plugging in, that it works so well, that was um, because of the assumption of this uh, compatibility. And the theorem just says like, um, you can do this for all kind of sets of observed variables. And uh, this like kind of solves like one of the problem in uh, causality. Um, where uh, these kind of marginalization properties are usually not there, not even in the DAG case. DAGs are not stable under marginalizations. So we can do this also with uh, cycles. Another property is that we can do all the interventions. Interventions in the causality setting is intervene in the system and want to know what's happening. So that's like the main challenge in causality. And intervening on this variable three here means just uh, we get rid of the influence of the parents and we get rid of all these functions which don't relate to cycles anymore and uh, we will set to the variable with three just to the value we have intervened on, and the rest stays the same. And also another theorem says we can do this, if everything is well defined and it's still like modular structure calls models. And this procedure um, allows us to define us all interventional distributions uh, like, uh, like Pearl in his book did. Like, so we can do this also with cycles and latent compounders nonlinear. So this is like uh, new, but it still, um, we still have this, so it's really well defined. So, um, so now is the question we talked about dependencies. So the question is, what kind of conditional dependencies or independencies are encoded in this model of structural causal models? And it's like an easy graphical criterion. So if you learned in machine learning deseparation, we want something like this. And yes, the answer is yes, spoiler. Um, and uh, we need to define a, a more elaborate graphical structure. And this graphical structure we call the sigma separation, a sigma, a sigma connection graph, and uh, the separation will be replaced by sigma separation. And yeah, as you can see, this is, uh, we stole the word from a D connection graph from, from this paper listed below. And uh, sigma connection graph now consists of nodes as before. We have now uh, directed edges, bidirected edges now, they weren't present before, and we also allow for undirected edges. And on top of this, this is now like new in comparison to this deconnection graph is, we also need a segmentation of the nodes into disjoint loops. And this looks like this. We can uh, say every node is its own segment, or we can say like this cycle on top is its own segment, or we can say like this whole big cycle in the middle was one segment. And uh, this is like additional structure we need to address, and it's a, it's a choice we have to make. Um, to address this problem. And every choice will give you a different sigma connection graph. So if we start now with this smaller structure causal model, what uh, sigma connection graph do we take? And there's one choice, uh, and this is like, we just first replace all latent confounders with bidirected edges. Um, we have no undirected edges at this stage. Uh, we define um, the segmentation of the loops to be like the biggest one you can take. So like we write it down, it's all the nodes which are ancestors and descendants of a node in itself. So here you can see the biggest cycles and they all form their own segmentation. So then if we have this, then we, we can prove, we can really prove this. We can say that um, uh, for, um, for any modular structure causal model, 
Um, if we have subsets of the nodes, it means like features of the, like the variables, subsets of the variables. If in the graph they're like sigma separated, I will explain in a moment, then also the variables are conditional independent. So if you have dependence in the conditional dependence in the, in the data, then you know like that the graph also needs to um, have these conditional dependence encoded in sigma separation in the graph. And the uh, naive generalization of uh, D separation, as you know it from uh, machine learning one or two, uh, is now replaced with the sigma separation. We defined this uh, last year, now in this paper. And uh, this coincides, so it's a real generalization, with uh, the D separation in the cyclic case. So if you assume I only consider a cyclic and you use sigma separation, it coincides with the old one. So with all these uh, definition we have there. And it also generalizes collapse graph criterion of spurt from 95. So we used this idea and generalized it to this setting. So sigma separation, what is it? So if you have a sigma connection graph, direct edges, bidirected, undirected edges, plus segmentation, then we say that a subset of the nodes, a two subsets of the nodes are sigma connected given a third one in G in symbols as is written there. If we can go through all the, if there exists a path of any type, so including all direct, bidirect, undirect edges, um, that is Z sigma open. That means that the end nodes are not in Z. And for every triple on this path, we check if it's a collider and if the middle node is in Z or it's an undirected edge there and the middle node is in Z or it's a right chain and the middle node is not in Z or, and this is like the new thing which like makes it different from D separation, that it, either, that it lies in Z and also in the same segment as the adjacent node which it's pointing to. And just by this little adjustment, we can now um, do something with nonlinearities. Without this adjustment, it only works for linear stuff. So we can do this now like for nonlinear um, structural causal models. And then for SOC, and similarly, and if all of this does not hold, we say that uh, W and Y is sigma separated given Z in this sigma connection graph. So, and uh, they have like very good properties. Um, sigma separation and sigma connection graphs are um, stable under um, marginalization and conditioning, and we have operators for them. So that means like instead of checking this in the big graph and running through all paths, I can marginalize all these nodes out and check this in a very small graph. I will check it show you in a minute. So we have here the graph from before, and we now want to show, like sh I will show you how this works, marginalization and um, conditioning. One on the left hand side is D separation and sigma separation, and this corresponds to this kind of segmentation. D separation is equivalent to taking this, like the smallest segmentation. So uh, we want to know if these are, uh, if these are, uh, if one is uh, independent of eight given three and five, and uh, we can now look at uh, these variables. We marginalize them out; they're not there anymore. Uh, we can look at this, we're conditioned on this, so we can do the conditioning operator, and you can see on the D separation side, because the segments are all different, uh, the direct edge disappears, and on the right hand side, because it's inside the segment, it still is there. We do the same, we have on the right hand side, we have this, and then on the uh, left, they disappear, we marginalize, we check it out, we have only two nodes, it's a very small graph, we only need to know are they adjacent or not. And on the left hand side, it's yes, so they are deseparated. On the right hand side is no, so they're not sigma separated. So that's the main difference. So that means like uh, we also have this done in big graph because we have the equivalence we proved. And we use this uh, theorem for algorithm. So the algorithm for causal discovery now says um, we run through all conditional independence tests in the available data, observational and interventional, we can do both. We check them all, we uh, give them a weight, and then we just run through all graphs, run using uh, this uh, conditioning and marginalization operator, and check if these co corresponding sigma uh, separation uh, separations are also in the graph. And if not, we penalize it, and if yes, like, uh, it, it satisfies this. And then we just take the one which fits best, like which has the smallest, um, um, like which fits best um, to the data with respect to the aggregated weights. And then, uh, we have a list, perhaps we have more, and we, we, they will be spit out. And we use the code from uh, this paper listed below. We just adjust it, we see simple rules for sigma separation and the theorem we provided. So uh, we have also some guarantees. 
saying uh, like we have some total consistency. So mainly if we make an additional assumption, then uh, this algorithm will find the correct um, features of the graph. And we have some results here on uh, toy examples where we randomly sample neural networks, they're nonlinear and graphs, and then trying to reconstruct this. And you see the red one as observational data only. And then if you have more and more interventions, we get better and better results, of course. And this is like in alignment with the consistency we had before. And also we find confounders and it gets better the more interventional data you provide. So um, conclusion, we introduce modular structure causal models, which allow for arbitrary nonlinear functions, arbitrary but probability distributions, so mixtures of discrete and continuous variables, for instance, latent confounders, feedback loops, cyclic interactions. We prove the closeness under intervention and marginalizations. We introduce sigma connection graphs and sigma separation. We prove that, there, that the modular structure causal models entail all these conditional independence implied by sigma separation. We define marginalization conditioning operators on these uh, and show that they're preserved under sigma separation. And they all kind of generalize the cyclic concepts. So they really like uh, non-naive generalizations of this to the non-linear case with cycles and confounders. And then we arrived at the first causal discovery algorithm which can handle all of these, like non-linear function relations, arbitrary probability distributions, latent confounders, feedback loops, multiple observation intervention and data sets, and we provided conditions on how to construct such modular structure causal models, sample from them, and demonstrate its above for neural networks. Thank you very much. <laughs>